Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Hello and welcome to our new short format servings of consciously prepared brain food designed to improve your mental fitness. This is Lisa Cypress came in your host. For more than 12 years, we've been proudly and consistently crafting harvesting happiness and sharing it with you. Each week, we spotlight diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. We invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. All righty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where you will learn how to achieve a clearer mind and a better life in three minutes a day. My guest today is Dr. Richard Dixie. He is the author of Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life. He is a senior faculty member at Dharma College in Berkeley, California, a research scientist and a lifelong student of Buddhism who holds advanced degrees in biophysics and the history and philosophy of science. Richard directed Bioelectronic Research Unit at London Hospital before becoming CEO of of his own biotech company. Richard moved to the U.S. in 2007 to devote himself to teaching meditation, deepening his own practice, and running the light of the Buddha Dharma Foundation in India, along with his wife, Wangmo, the eldest daughter of the well-known Tibetan Lama, Tarthong Tulku. Richard, I hope I pronounced all of that right. And thank you for joining me today on the show. That was perfect. <laughs> hey, and let's let's talk a little bit about the doctor because you so cheekily pointed out <laughs> what kind of doctor you are not. I'm a doctor of biophysics, unfortunately. So my expertise is in biological processes and how physical, how you can measure them physically. And it was partly because of that I got interested in meditation, actually. So, uh, but it's, I'm not a medical doctor. What you said to me, which really made me chuckle, is you're not a uh, take off your clothes kind of doctor. <laughs> exactly. Well, not which, as a job. <laughs> yeah, as a job, as a job. Exactly. So, uh, first of all, I want to share with you that I'm intrigued about a three minute a day practice because those of us who have been practicing meditation have been educated that there is a certain prescribed amount of time that is required each day to reach that that state of, you know, transcending or altered consciousness. And I love that you're going to share with us the history and the why that's not so. Sure. That'd be my pleasure. Um, You know, meditation comes from an Asian tradition that's unbroken. Actually, there are very, very few unbroken uh, lineages around. And the meditation traditions of Asia are unbroken. They go back at least two and a half thousand years, completely unbroken. And they represent a way of looking at experience as experience. Now, there's something very, very interesting about this, which is worth saying right from the get-go, because often people don't really get it. And yet it's so obvious that when you say it, it's like common sense. All we ever experience, and I mean, this is literally true, all we ever experience, all we ever can experience, all we ever will experience is either one of our five senses or our thoughts and imaginations. These are sometimes called the six gates. That's all we ever experience. Everything else is inferential. That's to say, an inference is where you say, there's smoke, so there must be a fire. Well, in exactly the same way, our visual sense, for example, the two eyes see slightly different things, and so they say, oh, there must be depth. It's an inference that we make from our senses. Our two ears, hear things in slightly different phases. Oh, there must be space. It's an inference. And this inferential knowledge is completely unacknowledged in our educational system. And indeed, on the whole, you read the papers. Only today I was reading about the Magellan Telescope. 
No one ever says these devices, which are incredible, and we're living in a golden age of scientific discovery, are nonetheless making inferences about what's out there. They're not really seeing what's out there because we have to see that and we have to make that inference. So this is a really fundamental insight and very important. Let me just jump in here and make sure I understand what you're saying, that there is data, but the person who views the data, there is a an inf- there's an inferred or a perception driven analysis of what that data really is, right? There, there, there is the, the nuts and bolts that are over here, and then how we see those nuts and bolts. Yes, except even the language you're using now, there is data, there are nuts and bolts, is to imply that somehow the nuts and bolts and the data are there. But actually, that is even an inference. Oh, all right. Tell us a little bit more about that, because that's a big concept. Yeah, it's a big concept. It's actually very basic, because when you think about it, all this language that we use is based upon our thoughts and imaginations or one of our five senses. That's all inferential. That is just philosophically unassailable. It is the case. And I'm not suggesting there's not an external world. That's not the statement here. The statement is this, can we know anything about this inferential process within which we are embedded? Is it just taken for granted? Can we know anything about it? Now, meditation is a way of knowing something about this seemingly automatic, reflexive is the word I use, inferential process. Now, this is where it's very fascinating because Modern materialist views always say the subject is unreliable, unreliable, just an opinion. In fact, the whole of scientific uh, knowledge is based upon the insights of Galileo. That's where modern science comes from. And Galileo's whole idea was that the subjective is mere opinion. And we have to be, quote, objective, which means you have to write the observer out of the picture. Now, of course, philosophically, that's impossible, as I just said. Right, right. Onto our five senses and our thoughts and imaginations. But there's something even more interesting. It turns out in this unbroken tradition that we get from ancient Asia, mainly India, there were insights that meditating monks wrote down in books, which are still here. And those insights are being confirmed by modern techniques, particularly cognitive psychology, as valid. For example, Meditators said, oh, consciousness flickers, flickers like this. We now know that is exactly the case. It's called the flicker fusion frequency. We can even tell you it's about 25 times a second. And they saw that and wrote it down, which means there is a way of getting valid information about our inferential process, which we can develop. And this is meditation. Now, meditation is literally to look at experience as experience, not to use our experience to make inferential statements about good and bad, whatever we want, etc. in the outside world, but to look at our experience as experience. Now, isn't that observation though? Well, this is where you have the same problem. When you (laughs) observe, what you're actually doing is making a hidden inference. You say, I see but actually, see, I, I reckon that's what's out there. I don't actually see it. I make a model of it in my mind. That's what I'm actually doing. We're not a camera. We are making a map of the world. We're not a camera. We're making a map. Now, this map making is intensely important. We have a word for it. We say we recognize. I recognize you. I've met you before. What is that word referring to? It's referring to a process in our cognition where the initial cognition is remembered and reflected back as a known thing. It's mean it's been mapped. And so suddenly, oh yeah, I met you a year ago, was it? Whatever. I recognize you. Now, this is really, really interesting. You can measure this. In time. And I can tell you that recognition takes about 450 milliseconds. Wow. That's two finger clicks, click, click. Yeah, yeah. 
that means we are behind experience about 250, behind actuality rather, our experience is behind actuality, about 250 milliseconds to 400 milliseconds at all times. Now, what happens in that gap? This is the question we need to ask. Well, we land up with a world, which is a name, in which there are things which are names, i.e. we make a world. Now, if we were merely a camera and the world we made was the world that existed, we'd be good. But we're not a camera. Actually, in that process of recognition, all our doubts, all our fears, all our education, all our background, all our beliefs, all our political affiliations, every single thing we've ever learned is being col- is being used to color this map and fill it full of things we want, things we don't want, things we want to get, things we want to avoid. All this information is coded into that map. As a result, it's very stressful. So we find ourselves being stressed by reflexive reactivity to a map that we ourselves make. I, the source of stress is coming from ourselves. I just want to go back to data and science for a moment, because you mentioned about being able to measure consciousness firing. Talk a little bit about that form of measurement. Is it through an fMRI that we can see activity in the brain? What is that? Really simple. Okay, there's two things to show you. The first is I actually opened my book with this, actually, this Three Minutes a Day book. Um, There's a video on the internet. It's kind of amazing. And it's it's pouring with rain. It's somewhere in southern states. I think it's in North Carolina. And there's a guy walking across a quadrangle under an umbrella, right? And then suddenly there's a lightning flash, and he doubles over and runs away. He's nearly hit by lightning. Slow the film down to frame by frame by frame, which you can do because it's on the internet. It's completely non-scientific. It's just a real observation. He's taking about two steps a second. Well, walking along, then suddenly... You see the lightning bolt actually as a frame hit the ground about four feet from him. The next frame, everything whites out. The next two frames, he keeps walking as if nothing has happened. And then he doubles over. You can see the gap. Now, this isn't a scientific experiment. It shows you it actually occurs in real life. In fact, even when you're nearly hit by lightning, there's a a 500 millisecond gap before you do anything. Now, this is really, really interesting. Now, you can go much more precise than that. What you can do is you can measure what are called moon faces. Now, a moon face is a photograph, some Marilyn Monroe type photograph, where you blow up the contrast. So the photograph is almost like just black and white. If you turn an image like that upside down, it doesn't look like a face. It just looks like a pattern. If you turn it the right way up, it looks like a face. Now you can show the upside down one to people. And what you get if you use EEG, just very simple EEG, is an activation at about 250 milliseconds after you've shown it, about a, about a quarter of a second. And that's, oh, there's something there. But there's nothing else there. It's just that nothing else happens. Put it the right way up. And what happens is you get the 250 millisecond activation. And then at about 450 milliseconds, you get a massive activation. Oh, is that who is that? Do I know that person? Is that That's Mary the Monroe? recognition process or the recognition process? And so there's the gap. It's about two hundred milliseconds. It is precisely definable. We absolutely know it's there. So the question is, can you look at that gap? Are you able to do so? Were you able to do so? You would become free of all those opinions and prejudgments and ideas you carry, you wish you never said that, and all that stuff that somehow dominates our life. And that's really what meditation is about. And when you talk about the three-minute practice, what you're saying is that we really don't need heaps of time to train ourselves to be in that space. Yes. Well, okay. Now let's just look at this. So most meditation traditions were developed by monks. And these Buddhist monks or or sometimes are Hindu monks, and they are meditating as a day job, basically. It's a career. (laughs) The result to them, one hour, two hours, whatever is fine. (laughs) What else am I going to do with my time? Now, 
actually, you can develop the necessary insights to have a meditation practice in a much shorter time. But the key is you have to know what you're doing and why. Now, this is where we get to a very interesting phenomenon, which is worth talking about as well. We are going to take a pause, and when we return, we will continue the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Richard Dixie, the author of Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life. To learn more, please go to richarddixie.com, and that's D-I-X-E-Y. On Facebook, you can find him at Richard Dixie, and there are a lot of them, so look for Richard Dixie 3. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Connect on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and follow me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen for nutritious helpings of positive goodness. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and at times we all need a little support. To learn more about cultivating sustainable well-being at home and at the office, visit HarvestingHappiness.com to explore experiential online and on-site optimal lifestyle management consulting services, including recovery fortification and life crisis triage. And we're back talking with Dr. Richard Dixie about how to achieve a clearer mind and a better life in three minutes a day. Let's get back to it. So, Richard, prior to the break, we were talking a little bit about a more streamlined process to the practice of meditation that takes all the technology, all of the philosophy, and makes it accessible to us in a briefer period of time each day. Talk a little bit about that. So we've touched on recognition and the fact that our recognition is reflexive. That's to say it's happening again and again and again in response to what comes to our senses or our thoughts. Okay, now let's go into that a bit in a bit more detail. I need to find a way of telling people who've never meditated what meditation is like. Now, the problem is meditation is not an object in the world. I've, if I said, this is a cup of coffee, I could show you a cup of coffee and you'd say, oh, it's a cup. Okay, I get it. It's a cup. However, if I talk about, say, the calm state, I can't show you anything. And furthermore, there are no words I can use to show you. Good example. Supposing I said to you, here's a piece of chocolate, and you'd never tasted chocolate. And then I said to you, well, it's brown, it's sticky, it's sweet, it melts in your mouth. It does all this kind of stuff. You would never, ever, ever have any idea what the taste of chocolate was until I gave you a piece of chocolate. At which point you go, oh, well, it's nice. Oh, that's chocolate. Okay, great. Now, in exactly the same way, what I'm doing in this book is precisely defining why you should look at a particular phenomenon, which happens in your own experience, and then giving a simple technique to identify it. Now, the key here is to understand concentration. Because concentration is absolutely the key to the lock. Now, I mentioned that we are reflexively reacting to a map that we make approximately 20 times a second, which about which we are unconscious. Honestly, they should teach this in school. I mean, really, like <laughs> reading, writing, and meditation would be a really good fourth grade syllabus, but it's not taught. So we're unconsciously reacting to that map, and we think the map is real when actually the map has been conditioned, colored by our own preconceptions, memories, history, etc. So what we have to do is to find a way of accessing that map. Now, as long as we are reactively responding the whole time to this map, we're being stirred up like a glass of water with a bit of mud in it, stirred up, stirred up, stirred up. What we have to do is settle. Now, if we can learn to settle, to become calm. This is called shamatha. We will see clearly, just like the glass of water settles and suddenly the water is clear. And the word for seeing clearly in the old language is vipassana. Pasana means see and v means clearly or, or directly, directly see. Okay, how do we do that? Well, we've all been taught to concentrate. So, you know, little Johnny gets told by his mummy, concentrate, concentrate. And at school, we're taught to concentrate the whole time. 
This type of concentration is technically speaking called adverting. You advert your concentration to a particular object, which is where the word advertising comes from. It takes your concentration, advertising. So here we are adverting our concentration. The problem is adverting is brittle. That's to say, if you concentrate on one thing, merely adverting to it, when a sound happens or a thought happens or any kind of other thing happens, you immediately advert to that. So you get this experience of being pulled around left and right by being adverted to other objects. That in itself can never achieve a calm state. And this is why there are so many people who say, oh, oh, I tried meditation, but it didn't work for me. It didn't work for them because they tried to advert their concentration as if that was the whole task. Now, it's because of this misunderstanding that people often say, oh, meditation is about having no thought. Or they have to go and meditate in a quiet room with absolutely no sound. All these ideas are wrong. They are actually wrong. And this is because there's a second part of concentration. And this is where the ancients have a great gift for us. The second part is savoring. Technically, it's called vikara. So the idea is you lift a cup of coffee to your lips. That's adverting. Taste the coffee. That's savoring. So one of the things I do very on in this book is distinguish adverting from savoring. Now, if you can savor your experience, it becomes stable. In fact, you can savor total silence without any sense input at all. Now, that state of savoring is intensely valuable because once you begin to savor experience, I actually inhabit your experience instead of reacting to it. You find you become much less reactive. And as a result, you become clearer. That's called vipassana. And so you start having alternatives, which you can see clearly, which happen despite your itch to just react based upon. <laughs> yes. Oh, so that is the blessing of meditation. Now, we live in a world where we're carrying around portable computers, mobile phones, which are designed to capture our attention. The level of reflexive reactivity in our culture is going up and up and up and up. Now we have ChatGBT doing even more sophisticated, adverting, capturing our attention. As a result, people are feeling disempowered. They're feeling stressed. They are emotionally frazzled, exhausted by their experience. What I try to do in this book is break down exactly how you can become less reactive, not by trying to close your mind, close your ears, disappear into a box, but by learning to respond rather than react to what is presented. If you can do that, you get an enormous benefit, which is literally pervasive across the whole of your experience. Because remember, all your experience is just the five senses or thoughts and imaginations. There is nothing else. And once you get this basic life skill, you have the taste of meditation, just like the guy who gives you a piece of chocolate has given you the taste of chocolate. And that's what I try to do in this book. And I made an app so you can put it on your phone. And the deal is really simple. I try to explain, and I, I think I'm pretty good at it, what we, I want you to do. Then you just do it for three minutes a day for seven days. Then there's another exercise. Do that for three minutes a day for seven days. By the end of 14 weeks, it's about five hours in total, but it's literally the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee. You will find that you know what meditation is. Now, if you then want to go on and sit for eight hours and whatever, you can, of course. But if you just want to be more creative or you just want to be less stressed or you just want to take, a, take some time out during the day, just five seconds where you step outside the reactivity, you can. So meditation is a basic life skill. You can learn it just like learning the violin. It really isn't mystical or complicated in any way. Well, I think that presenting this as the concept of savoring is is 
very user friendly. The other thing I think that you touch upon that is valid for, I, I'm going to say all of us is our nervous systems are so activated by all of the technology that we're surrounded by and what that technology, where it taps into the brain and thus the, the nervous system. So the ability to be able to work with that and settle, as you describe it, uh, is hugely helpful and it makes it's it accessible. Really there are lots of scientific studies talking about how this technology taps into the brain. This is typical scientific language. Now, actually, yes, it does tap into the brain, but that isn't going to help you deal with it. The fact that a neurophysiologist can tell you which part of your brain chat GBT is activating does nothing for you. You get this piece of information. So bookshops are full of books, 101 ways to be happy by some clinical physiologist or something or neurophysiologist. These are not going to work. What you have to do is take control yourself of your own cognition. And all of these scientific experiments, while they give us insight into how our brains work, do not tell us how to be human beings. Being a human being is a life skill, mm -hmm. which despite our scientific knowledge. It is never unified by it. There is never going to be a time ever in history where objective scientific language will, quote, explain personal experience. Personal experience is yours. The trick is, can I live a better life if I become less reactive? It is so obvious what the answer is to that question. One hardly needs to ask it, but that is what meditation gives. And you can learn it really, really simply. It is a, a very unfortunate side effect of our modern educational system that it isn't taught. And as a result, people are crippled by reactivity they don't understand because it's happening so fast and it's happening all the time in front of them, like I'm clicking my fingers, that they never, ever get to grips with it. You can get to grips with it. You can find yourself with calmness. And the ability to look at things in a fresh way, almost like magic, just because you're not reacting. And the reactivity is coming from you. What these clever people are doing is they're learning what triggers you and triggering you. But if you can rest in cognition rather than recognition, you are totally free of them. They can't touch you. You have become free yourself. And this is what meditation is for. It's to make you free yourself. And so to me, this is a fundamental life skill. And I'm really, really excited to present it in a way that I think people can approach. We are nearly out of time. And I want to just cover a couple more points here. In your book, Three Minutes a Day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life, you talk about smiling during meditation, that you encourage uh, your readers to smile when they are in, in process of meditation. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Now, reactivity is tense. It's a, it's a state of tension. As you react, you become tense. And indeed, a lot of people try to meditate. <laughs> Another to try to meditate is actually tense. It makes you more reactive, yeah. not now, when you look at the classic image of a meditator, and that's nearly always a Buddha image, and there are Buddhas in every bathroom now. Everybody's got Buddhas there everywhere. You look at the Buddha, he's always smiling. Little smile, not a big smile, it's a small smile. And why is that? Well, it turns out that, if, again, if you look at the old meditation manuals, they say that sukha, which is happiness, is a precursor to samadhi, which is calm awareness. Now, the interesting thing about smiling is when you smile, you feel happy. It's the weirdest physiology. If you ever smile, you immediately get this little feeling of happiness. It's not a strong feeling. It's just a slight feeling. And so my advice to meditators, and this is a killer piece of advice, is when you're being disturbed by your thoughts, by whatever's happening, smile and go back to your meditation with a smile. That calms you and makes you less reactive. So you can then engage with your meditation more efficiently. And this is one of the little tips. I've got lots of little tips like that in this book. Just help us navigate 
our internal experience. And finally, let's talk about thoughts, thoughts that rise and fall in meditation. And you're, um, you teach us that thought is not the enemy in meditation. Let's talk about this. Mapping. Now, it all comes back to mapping. All mapping is thoughts. It is because of our ability to learn from our experience that a naked ape has gone from being eaten by saber-toothed tigers on the savannas of Africa to driving around in a Ferrari. That is literally what did it. It was the map. We can take experiences, remember them, and apply them to our current circumstances. They appear as thoughts. Thoughts go, is it this? Is it that? Is it this? Is it that? They're always flying around trying to work out what the best map might be. So thoughts are a ubiquitous part of our inner experience. They're not going to stop. The idea that thoughts would stop is like saying stop breathing or something. They're part of our physiology. Now, thoughts are protective. The whole map is protective. This is why we never want to read good news. We only want to read bad news. It's not because the newspaper moguls are evil people. It's because no one buys a newspaper with the headline, something went well. They buy the newspaper because it said something went badly. Why is that? Our map is interested in bad stuff because it wants to know whether it should change behavior so it doesn't happen again. That's what the map does. So we have this paranoid it's almost like I always used to say it's like a like a maiden aunt. It's like a paranoid maiden aunt who's always saying, don't go out, don't do this, don't do that, always saying don't. And this paranoid advisor is reflexively triggering according to what happens in our senses. So as long as we live in the control of this advisor, thoughts are going to be an enemy, like a prison imprisoning us in paranoia. Once we get less reactive, thoughts come and go like yeah. clouds and die. They're not an issue. And furthermore, some of them can be very helpful. So you end up going, oh, that's a good idea. You're suddenly using your map to help you navigate your life rather than your map being a prisoner that makes your life a reactive, exhausting trial from one day to the next. And again, it all comes down to one simple thing. Learn to meditate. Simple as that. Richard Dixie, thanks for spending part of your day with me. We've been talking about three minutes a day, a 14-week course to learn meditation and transform your life. To learn more, please go to richarddixie.com, and that's D-I-X-E-Y. On Facebook, you can find him at Richard Dixie with the number three. Be aware, there are many Richard Dixies, and that's D-I-X-E-Y. Thank you so much, Richard. Pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa Cypress-Kamen on behalf of my guest, Dr. Richard Dixie, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember, happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime and anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from our mental muscle toning libraries at HarvestingHappinessTalkRadio.com, Toginet.com, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. To learn more about my global consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Spread more joy by liking us on Facebook at Harvesting Happiness and following me on Twitter at Lisa Kamen. Harvesting Happiness is produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mengeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Gus, in collaboration with Toginet Radio, KBUU Radio Malibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange. <laughs>